So welcome everyone. My name is Adriana. I am a winter naturalist at the Aspen Center for Environmental Studies. If this is your first time at ACES, then welcome. If this is your second or millionth time at ACES, then welcome back. Um, each winter, ACES partners with Wilderness Workshop and the Roaring Fork Audubon to co-host Naturalist Nights, a free winter speaker series featuring experts from across the country who explore different topics of the natural world with our community. Talks will be hosted every other week, Wednesdays at the Roaring Fork High School in Carbondale, and Thursdays here at Helm Lake. We would like to thank our generous sponsors that help make Naturalist Nights a success. Thank you to our gold level sponsors, Reese Henry and Company, Ken Raverford, Ken Ransford, Clark's Market. Thank you to our silver level sponsors, Ute Mountaineer, Blazing Adventures, Bristlecone Mountain Sports, and Aspen Square. And thank you in kind donations to Two Leaves in a Bud, which is the tea you're drinking tonight, Aspen Snowmass, and Bonfire Coffee. Grassroots TV is live streaming tonight's presentation on their website, Wilderness Workshop, and ACES Facebook page and YouTube channel. A cleaned up recording will be made available on the ACES and Wilderness Workshop's YouTube channel in the coming days. We hope you will join us here next week for a Potbelly Perspectives talk titled, Trekking, Schools, and Serendipity in Nepal. Stories from Shireen Sarik. This talk will be held on Wednesday, February 28th at 6 p.m. And now I'm excited to introduce tonight's speaker, Nathan Peeplo, like a bird would say it. As a naturalist at ACES, leading nature tours, I talk frequently about how plants and animals communicate and how that might be different from our own style of communication as humans. So I'm very excited to learn about the language of birds from Nathan Peeplo. Nathan Peeplo grew up in South Dakota where he got started identifying bird songs by studying the classic Birding by Ear, field guides in the Peterson series. He is now a sound recordist and ethologist, a student of animal behavior. Peeplo lives in Boulder, Colorado, where he teaches writing and rhetoric at the University of Colorado. He is a former editor of the quarterly journal, Colorado Birds, and one of the developers of the Colorado Co County Birding website and the Colorado Birding Trail. Please remember to hold your questions until the end of the presentation when we will have a brief Q&A se session. So thank you and please welcome Nathan Peeplo. Thank you so much. It's a thrill to be here. Can everybody hear me yep. at this level of voice? Um, so I got to speak last night in Carbondale and tonight I get to speak in Aspen and it's a thrill to be here in the Roaring Fork Valley. I don't come and spend much time here in winter uh, because I don't ski, uh, but it's really nice to be here in this uh, in a new time of year for me. Tonight um, we're going to talk about what birds are actually saying to one another when they're singing and calling. And up on the screen here, we have a common yellow throat, and uh, the song of the common yellow throat sounds like this. Does that sound about right? Does it about the right level of volume, I mean, for everybody? That little squiggly shape up above my name is the yellow throat's song. That is what we call a spectrogram. That is a computer-generated graph of the sound that you just heard. So it's a little bit like reading music. It goes from left to right. The high notes are at the top. The low notes are at the bottom. We're not going to talk tonight about how to read spectrograms, <laughs> but I do want you to know that they exist. And you will, at, at times during my talk tonight, see some funny-shaped squiggles appear on the screen when a bird is singing and I want you to know what they are. They are actually a picture of the sound. And you know, if you ever wanna know how somebody can write a field guide to bird sounds, this is how. You can actually picture and visualize the sound. And with practice, you can learn to read them and understand what you're going to hear. But like I said, all you need to know for now is that that's a sound. I like to say that all around us, all the time, the birds are always telling us who they are and what they're doing. For example, that bird just told you it was a red-winged blackbird. 
It told you that it was a male. And it told you a few other things. But we'll get to that in a minute. That bird also just told you it was a red-winged blackbird. It told you that it was a female. And it told you a few other things, which we'll get to in a minute. We can learn the language of the birds and figure out what they're actually saying to one another. For example, that's a cliff swallow. You might be familiar with cliff swallows. They nest in big colonies underneath bridges in the summertime. And if you walk up underneath the bridge where all the cliff swallows are nesting, they'll all fly out over your head and circle around you. And they will make this sound. because that zew sound in, is the word in cliff swallow language that means danger. But cliff swallows have other words in their language too, like this one. <laughs> that is a sound that cliff swallows only make on cool, cloudy days. Because on cool, cloudy days, it becomes difficult to be a cliff swallow. When it's raining and misting and chilly in the summertime, cliff swallows feed on swarms of flying insects. But it, when, it's, when the weather is misty and cold, the flying insects don't like to fly. So what happens on those cool, cloudy, misty days is that all the cliff swallows fan out from the colony in different directions, hoping that one of them is going to get lucky and actually find a swarm of insects that's flying in spite of the weather. And if one of those cliff swallows gets lucky and finds flying insects, it makes this sound. And that immediately recruits all the other cliff swallows, all the other members of the colony within earshot to come as quick as they can and take advantage of that swarm of flying insects while it is still on the wing. It is possible that other species of swallows have food finding calls like the cliff swallow. If they do, we do not know about it. The only reason we know what this word means in cliff swallow language is because there was one researcher who went back and kept studying the same colony of cliff swallows in Nebraska every summer for 25 years. And somewhere around year 14, they discovered this call and they did a rather ingenious set of experiments to demonstrate what, it, what its function was. The vast majority of birds in North America and the world have not been anywhere near that well studied. And so in the book that I wrote, where I try to explain what all the birds are saying, the words more study needed appear on every single page. <laughs> but that's actually what I love the most about bird sounds. What I love the most about bird sounds is that when you are studying bird sounds, you are standing right at the edge of human knowledge. It is way easier for anybody in this room to go into their backyard and record a bird sound that's never been recorded before than it is for you to take your camera anywhere in the world and photograph a bird that's never been photographed before. We just don't know that much about bird sounds, even of the common bird sounds. Uh, all around us. And that's actually really exciting. And if those of us in this room start making more recordings with our phones and uploading more recordings of bird sounds to the internet, we can actually start to help researchers solve some of these mysteries. But we'll talk more about that in a minute later in the talk. So tonight, we're going to talk about a few species of birds that actually have been well studied so that we actually do have a pretty good idea of what they're saying to one another. And we're going to start with these red-winged blackbirds, this pair that you already met. We're going to come back to the red-winged blackbirds multiple times uh, tonight. First of all, because they have been well studied and we have a pretty good idea what red-winged blackbirds are saying to one another. And secondly, because red-winged blackbirds are hands down the most vocally interesting birds in North America. And most of you have probably heard red-winged blackbirds a whole lot. Uh, they were singing just an hour ago right out here on the nature trail. They're probably here all summer. Uh, you have access to red-winged blackbirds anywhere in the country. 
as long as you have some kind of marshy, cattail-y kind of habitat in the summer. You may already be familiar with the male's song. He sings like, Konkari. We were just hearing it out here an hour ago. You're probably not as familiar with the female's song. The female sings, totally different song from the male. And these two, when they, when they are a mated pair, they very frequently duet with one another. And you have probably heard that duet a hundred times, but you probably didn't realize you were hearing a duet. First of all, because the two songs sound so different, you didn't realize that they were even probably the same species. Secondly, you don't realize it's a duet because the two birds don't sing at exactly the same time. When they duet, the male starts singing, and then halfway through his song, the female starts singing. So he starts it, they overlap for a second in the middle, and then she finishes it out. And the third reason you might not have realized you were hearing a duet is because when these two birds are duetting, they're not necessarily sitting right next to each other like this. They might be, or they might be five feet apart, or they might be 50 feet apart. The male might be up where you can see him on the top of a cattail. The female might be down in the reeds closer to the nest, out of sight. But if you are hearing the male song and then halfway through his song, this answering from somewhere in the vicinity, you know you are hearing a male-female pair, a mated pair of red-winged blackbirds. This is what it sounds like. And that is those two birds saying, I love you to one another. <laughs> that is a pair bonding exercise, pair bonding ritual for those two birds. It's also really useful for humans to understand that you're listening to a mated pair. If you're doing like breeding bird survey work or breeding bird atlas work, this is actually really, really good knowledge. Also, related species of birds do the exact same thing. Meadowlarks do the exact same thing. The female has a rattle call. She starts it halfway through her mate's song. Those two birds could be 100 yards apart on the prairie, but they will tell you that they're a mated pair if you hear the male sing and you hear this rattle call start halfway through his song, even if it's way off in the distance. That's a male-female pair of meadowlarks. Brown-headed cowbirds do the exact same thing. The female has a rattle call. She starts it halfway through her mate's song. So these are things that you can start to listen for and understand what the birds are saying to one another. But when the male and female blackbird are duetting, they're not just saying, I love you, to one another. They're also sending a message to all the other red-winged blackbirds in the marsh. They're also saying, I'm taken. Or more specifically, they're saying, my mate is taken. <laughs> So male red-winged blackbirds will mate with multiple females and then defend all those females against other males. The females will mate with one male and then defend that male against other females. And so when these two are duetting, they're actually saying this territory right here around this nest is occupied by a mated pair. There's no room for another male or another female coming in right here. Their territories are very small because they live in a marsh with lots of other red-winged blackbirds, but they do have territories around each nest. Now, male red-winged blackbirds actually have two totally different kinds of songs. They have the familiar konkari song that you hear all the time, but they have a much rarer song that we call the flight song, because it's almost always given when the bird is in flight. We don't 100% know for sure what the flight song actually means, but here's our best guess. <laughs> that flight song sounds like a long string of call notes, and that's basically what it is. But each individual male red-winged blackbird has his own specific string of call notes that is his flight song. And so the flight song specifically, individual, uh, specifically identifies each individual. When I say we don't know for sure 
that that's what the what the flight song means. Usually, the red winged blackbird makes the flight song when it's leaving its territory. So it seems like maybe it would be a signal to the female that she has to hold down the fort while the male is away. But male red winged blackbirds do not make the flight song every time they leave their territory. And they sometimes make it when they're on their way back to their territory. So it's not entirely clear what's going on there. Female red winged blackbirds also have two totally different kinds of songs. There's the one that we already heard. The I'm taken slash I love you song. But they also have a more aggressive song that they use when they are defending their territory against other female red winged blackbirds. And it sounds like this. You can hear how that sounds much harsher. That's a more aggressive message. But the interesting thing is that female red winged blackbirds can mix and match the notes of those two different kinds of songs to express a range of emotions in between I love you and get out of my territory. <laughs> so they have this ability to, to send other messages along that spectrum by mixing and matching song notes. Now sometimes in bird language, one sound can have many meanings. And this shouldn't be too strange because in human languages, we do the exact same thing. There are multiple words in the English language that sound the same, but they mean different things. And whenever we use one of those words when we're talking, we figure out what the other person means from context. Birds do the exact same thing. So for example, here's a little ruby crown kinglet when this guy is nesting up here in, in the Roaring Fork Valley in the summer, he's got a long, beautiful song that he sings. He's got a couple of other calls that he makes. But when he goes down to Arizona and Texas for the winter, all winter long, he basically just makes one sound all winter long. It's just a little call that sounds like chit, chit, chit it. That one sound has to do a lot of functions for that ruby crown kinglet all winter long. First of all, it's a contact call to keep foraging flocks together to say, I'm over here. But it's also the alarm call that warns of danger. And if this bird finds a screech owl perched during the daytime and wants to drive it away, then this would also serve as a mobbing call to recruit other small birds to come and try to drive the predator away. So how do the other birds know which of those meanings the ruby crowned kinglet intends when it's only got one word that it says all winter long? Just like us, they pay attention to the context. So they're going to pay attention to this bird's body language. They're going to pay attention to whether it seems agitated, whether it's orienting in a particular direction, whether his little red crown is uh, exposed in excitement or concealed when he's calm. Uh, whether they can see a predator or an owl or whether they can't. They're going to pay attention to all of those things, how fast the bird is calling, things like that. And they're going to then deduce what that call means from context. Again, not too strange because human language works the same way. But if one sound can have many meanings in bird language, it's also true in bird language that sometimes one meaning can have many sounds. And to illustrate this point, I'm going to talk about the bird species that, as far as we know, has the largest vocabulary of any bird in the world. Those words, as far as we know, are doing a lot of work in that sentence, because, as I said, very few of the world's 10,000 bird species have actually been really well studied in terms of their vocal communication. It's entirely possible there are birds out there with larger vocabularies. But the one we've found so far with the biggest vocabulary doesn't live around here, but it's a common bird in the eastern United States. And it's not a mockingbird, but it's a relative of the mockingbird. It's the brown thrasher. Brown thrashers, when they sing, they sing a song phrase that lasts about one second long, and then they pause for a second, and then they sing a different song phrase that's about one second long, and then they pause for a second, and then they sing for a second, and then they pause for a second. And these different song phrases tend to be very, very different from one another. 
and researchers wanted to know how many different song phrases does a brown thrasher know. I'm going to play you a little bit of brown thrasher song, and I want you to listen and see if you can hear if the bird ever repeats itself. <coughs> That was a brown thrasher singing for 40 seconds, and it did not repeat itself once during that time. Researchers wanted to know how many different song phrases a brown thrasher could actually sing. So a researcher named Donald Kruzma took one of his grad students out on the campus of the University of Massachusetts in 1978, and they recorded one individual brown thrasher singing for 113 straight minutes. So just shy of two hours. And then they took that tape back to the laboratory and tried to figure out how big is this bird's vocabulary. They had to do some estimations, but when they were done estimating, they estimated that that individual bird knew between 2,000 and 2,500 different song phrases. Just to put that in perspective, your vocabulary as an adult speaker of English is probably on the order of 25,000 words. So here's a bird that has a vocabulary about 10% the size of yours, and its brain is the size of your fingernail. <laughs> That's amazing, but it's possible that brown thrashers are saving some brain space when they are remembering these thousands of different song phrases, because as far as we can tell, every single one of those words in brown thrasher language means the exact same thing. <laughs> Every single one of those song phrases means I'm a brown thrasher and I'm looking for somebody to share my territory with. <laughs> Which immediately raises the question, why do you need 2,500 ways to say that? And the answer is, we have no idea. <laughs> Science has not figured this out yet. This is a bird related to the mockingbird, but its vocabulary is on average 10 times larger than a mockingbird's vocabulary. We actually don't know how that vocabulary got so big or what keeps it so big. The standard uh, hypothesis in, in evolutionary biology for why this would occur is called sexual selection, also known as female choice. The basic idea being that at some point in the evolutionary history of the brown thrasher, female brown thrashers developed a preference for males who did not repeat themselves. <laughs> And then the males with the larger vocabularies are the ones who get picked to carry on their genes to the next generation, and over time the vocabulary keeps growing. Here's the problem with that hypothesis as I see it. If female brown thrashers are playing that game, that means they would have to tell the difference between the male on this side of the block who knows 2,200 song phrases and the male on that side of the block who knows 2,500 song phrases so that they can choose this guy. That means they would have to listen to everything that came out of both of those males' mouths for hours, if not days, and remember every single thing so that they understand when, when he runs out of new words. And we're pretty sure they're not making that much effort. So they're probably choosing their mates via some other mechanism, and we have no idea what that might be. And that means we don't understand why that vocabulary could possibly be so big. Because in theory, it takes a lot of time, energy, and brain power to memorize all those songs and then produce them constantly. Why would the birds do that if there wasn't a benefit to it? 
we don't know the answer. And this is a super common bird that's in almost everybody's backyard east of the Mississippi River. And we don't know this fundamental question about its vocal communication. This is what I mean when I say there are so many fascinating mysteries out there right in our own backyards. There are tons of mysteries about American robin song. There's not a more common bird in North America, and we don't understand why American robin song is structured the way it is. These are questions that we could all start actually figuring out answers to if we started uploading more of our own recordings. So, in bird language, as we said before, sometimes one sound can have many meanings. Sometimes one meaning can have many sounds. And sometimes it's complicated. <laughs> and to illustrate this point, we're going to come back to our friends, the red-winged blackbirds. Only now we're going to talk about their calls instead of their songs. So when red-winged blackbirds are not singing, when, when males are not singing or otherwise occupied, they're probably sitting up on top of a cattail stalk giving call notes. And most of those call notes sound like chuck, or maybe some of them sound like seer, like a whistled call. And each individual male red-winged blackbird has between 12 and 20 different calls of this type, which we call alert calls. Uh, here are an example. Here are some examples of alert calls of a male red-winged blackbird. That's 10 different alert calls from one male red-winged blackbird. That might be half of that individual's alert call vocabulary. If you go to any marsh in North America, you will find that the males have 12 to 20 of these alert calls, and you will find that all the males in that same marsh all agree on the same 12 to 20 alert calls. They all share a local vocabulary. But if you drive 30 to 50 miles down the road to another marsh, you will find that all the males in that other marsh have a repertoire of 12 to 20 different alert calls than the ones in the first marsh. So these alert calls vary geographically all around the red-winged blackbird's range, but in any given location, they're more or less agreed upon. And that's not all that the males agree upon. When they are calling in this alert posture, they're sitting up on top of a cattail stalk calling, there's males scattered all over the marsh calling, they all pick one of the 12 to 20 calls that they know, and they all give that one over and over, and it's all the same one from all the males in the marsh. And then after a while, they'll switch. But at any given moment, they're, they're all echoing each other and giving the same call. Researchers noticed that the calls tended to switch when danger appears, like when a hawk flies over. And that suggested a reason why red-winged blackbirds might have multiple kinds of alarm calls. Maybe those different calls send different messages. So for example, maybe there's different kinds of calls for different kinds of predators. Or maybe the call notes explain which direction the danger is coming from, high or low or north or south. Or maybe the different calls explain how high the danger level is. Researchers wanted to figure out the answer to this, so they got themselves a stuffed Cooper's hawk, and they put it on a stick. And then they got themselves a bed sheet and a really long string, so that they could go out into the marsh and stick this stuffed Cooper's hawk in the mud on its fake perch in front of a red-winged blackbird's favorite song perch, and they could cover the hawk with the bed sheet and then back up a long ways holding that string. So that they could wait for that male red-winged blackbird to forget that the new thing is there and come back and start calling. And then at a certain point, they could whip the bed sheet off. And from the perspective of that male red-winged blackbird, it would be like a Cooper's hawk suddenly appeared right in front of him. And then they would re record the calls that the male was making before the hawk appeared and after the hawk appeared to try to figure out which of these calls means Cooper's Hawk. So let's say that 
They start out, all the males in the marsh are giving this call. They're all echoing one another. At a certain point, the, the researchers yank that, that bed sheet off. The hawk appears. As soon as the first red-winged blackbird spots the hawk, he switches to that seer call, and all the other males in the marsh immediately follow suit and echo with the seer call. So the red-winged blackbird researchers thought, okay, maybe the seer call is the hawk alarm call. Try it again. Before the hawk shows up, all the males are giving this call. Whip that bed sheet off. And the males switch to that call. Try it again. Before the hawk shows up, they're all giving that call. And then when the hawk shows up, they switch to that one. As they did this experiment over and over again, what they eventually realized is that it doesn't matter which call the red-winged blackbirds switch to when the hawk shows up. What matters is that they switch calls. In other words, in red-winged blackbird language, any call repeated over and over again means all clear. And any switch from one call to another means danger. When I learned this, it absolutely blew my mind because human language works nothing like this. This is a language where the individual words are completely meaningless. And all of the meaning is encased in the syntax, which is the relationship of the calls to one another in time. I love this because it reminds us of how creative nature is. I've been using the words bird language tonight, but there is no bird language. There's over 10,000 bird languages. Every species of bird has its own language. Every species of bird has had to come up with its own creative solution to the problem of how to communicate using sound. And some of them have found way different solutions than humans have. And this, this helps us remember that we don't know everything and we haven't necessarily found always the ideal solution to everything. So that brings me to the books that I wrote, The Peterson Field Guide to Bird Sounds of Eastern North America and Western North America. I tried to create a dictionary for the language of the birds so that you could go in and actually learn what each species is saying. As I said earlier, we actually don't know, you know with, with great precision what most of these species are saying, but I tried to put in what we do know, and then I wrote more study needed over and over again uh, throughout the whole book. Another thing I wanted to do with this field guide was get us all using the same language to talk about what we're hearing. We have a shared vocabulary to describe how birds look such that if you saw a bird and then you wrote a detailed description of it and you handed it to me, I could probably figure out what bird you saw. There's no reason we can't do the same thing for sounds. It's just that we haven't ever sat down and actually agreed on what we're gonna call the different parts of a sound. We have an agreed upon vocabulary for what birds look like. We agree on the names of the colors. We agree on the names of the parts of a bird. In fact, there's a little diagram at the start of most field guides that teach you the parts of a bird in case you didn't know. And we agree on the names of the visual patterns. Like for example, we agree on the difference between a spot and a stripe. There's no reason we can't also agree on the difference between a series and a trill. It's just that we haven't sat down and standardized our vocabulary. So I created a standardized vocabulary I tried to use words that we already used to describe sounds so I didn't have to invent new words, but I defined them specifically so that we can all know exactly what we're talking about when we use those words. And I'm also interested in comparing similar sounding species. So if you go into the book and you go to the male red winged blackbird song down at lower right, it's got some italic page numbers that lead you to an index at the back of the book 
where there's a list of other birds that sound similar. So if you're hearing something and it's kind of like a red winged blackbird song, but not quite, you can actually go and see what are all the birds that might sound like that. And if you move from the back of the book forward, that means you can actually look up a sound you don't know. Same way you can look up a word you don't know in the dictionary, as long as you can spell it. You can look up a sound you don't know as long as you can describe it using standardized terminology. So the inside back cover of the book has this quick index. Here on the left, these are all the single notes. If you heard a single note, you match it to this description. And then it sends you to the part of the index where birds sound like that. And it'll give you lists of birds. Here, these are all the trills and series. These are all the same note repeated. And then over there on the right are all the more complicated song patterns. But the really cool thing now is that we don't even need to, to use this in order to get a handle on what birds are saying. Because now our phones are doing all sorts of cool stuff for us. And there's a couple of apps that I'll mention tonight that can really help uh, everybody figure out how to record and understand bird sounds. One I'm going to talk about is called Song Sleuth. And Song Sleuth is no longer being supported by its developer, but you can still download it, last I checked, for both iPhone and Android. And when you start recording using Song Sleuth, it gives you this real-time scrolling spectrogram. So right now you're seeing a spectrogram of my voice. <clears throat> and if I snap, you'll see vertical lines appear on the spectrogram. If I whistle, you'll see horizontal lines. And if I hold this phone up to a singing bird, the bird will sign its name right on my phone. <laughs> and the beautiful thing about uh, Song Sleuth is that if you want to pause that spectrogram, you just touch it. You can slide it back and forth. You can pinch zoom it in both directions to like zoom in on the sound. You can go back to scrolling at any time. And there's a record button. So at any time you can hit record whenever you want and be recording the bird sound. It also has a two second pre-record buffer, which is a beautiful thing. It means right now it's not recording, but it actually is recording on a continuous two second loop. It's recording two seconds of audio and then recording over that two seconds of audio and then recording over that two seconds of audio until I hit the record button. As soon as I hit the record button, the most recent two seconds of audio become the first two seconds of my new file, and then it records from there. Which means you can sit underneath a singing bird, wait for it to sing, then hit record, and you didn't miss the start of the song, and you don't have 40 seconds of silence at the start of your of your file or a two minute blank file because the bird decided to never sing or fly away. Um, so pre-record buffers are beautiful things. There's another app that probably many of you are familiar with called Merlin. And Merlin is a free app from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. And one of the things that it can do is automatic sound ID. So if you download the sound ID, and get it going. Again, you'll see a real-time scrolling spectrogram. It's recording from the minute that, that this spectrogram starts rolling. Um, so it's all already recording my voice right now. And you cannot stop or pause or zoom that spectrogram, but it does record it. But the cool thing that Merlin does is that it knows a lot of bird sounds automatically. So if you're out and it hears a bird that it recognizes, it'll pop the name of that species up right underneath your spectrogram. And then if it hears a second species that it recognizes, it'll pop that second bird species name down under the first. And it'll make a whole list of everything that it hears or thinks it hears um, for you. It's not perfect. It makes mistakes. It doesn't know every single bird sound in the United States. And sometimes it gets confused. Uh, out here, I ran into a black-capped chickadee, and Merlin was confused as to whether it was a black-capped chickadee or a mountain chickadee. It told me both species were present when all the sounds were coming from a black-capped chickadee. Mm -hmm. So you do have to be careful and understand what kinds of mistakes Merlin makes. It's better than humans at some things. It's way worse than humans at other things. <laughs> it doesn't know every single bird. But we can all make Merlin better.
because it's an artificial intelligence that is only as good as its training data. And so one of the things you can do if it's messing up on black capped and mountain chickadees, especially here in the Roaring Fork Valley, what you can do is you can go out and find the chickadee and record it. And as long as you're paying attention and you know for sure that all of the sounds on this recording were black capped chickadee, then you upload it to your eBird checklist, that recording you made, under the name black capped chickadee. And those are the most, most important kinds of recordings uh, to upload are the ones that Merlin gets wrong. Mm -hmm. If you can see the bird and you know what it is, and Merlin's getting it wrong or getting confused, and you record it and you upload it under the correct name, eventually that recording will be ingested into the Merlin training data, and Merlin will get better at identifying black-capped and mountain chickadees by like, being corrected on its mistakes. Or if, say, the local, the local dialect of spotted toeys in your region is not getting picked up all the time by Merlin, record it, upload it, and that will teach Merlin what the spotted toys sound like here so that it will get better at recognizing them, for example. So that's one way that we could do a service with our own recordings of our own phones. I should mention there's a website that accompanies my book, petersonbirdsounds.com. It's free to access. No purchase of the book is necessary. You can listen to 7,500 bird sounds from North America. If I do say so myself, it's the most complete and best curated uh, collection of bird sounds for North America. If you go to the website, it looks like this. You can enter the species name down there. If you type in, say, Northern Mockingbird, it'll pop up all the Northern Mockingbird recordings, and it'll tell you exactly which vocalizations are on each recording and where they're from. And then if you click to play one, you'll see the picture, the spectrogram of the sound. You'll see it scroll as the sound plays and you'll be able to listen to it. And this is a really great way to learn spectrograms, to learn how to, co to uh, connect the shapes with the sounds is by watching uh, how the sounds and the shapes go by in real time. So, that brings me to the end of my prepared remarks. Thank you so much for having me, and I will now be happy to answer any questions you may have. And if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, are you gonna make an announcement? Yes. I'm going to be passing it to you if you have a question so that the questions also go to the live stream audience. Um, so I'm going to take it to whoever had their hand up. Hi. Thank you. When you see a tree full of like 100 crows making a racket, what do you think they're saying? If I see a tree full of 100 crows making a racket, mm -hmm. the first thing I wonder is if they are mobbing an owl mm -hmm. uh, or a hawk. Um, that's not the only reason that crows make a racket, but that is the number one reason that crows make a huge racket, is that there's some kind of owl or hawk there that they are upset about and they're trying to drive it away. They're trying to mob it, just like the small birds will mob small owls. Um, Red-tailed hawks and great, great horned owls will attract flocks of crows that will eventually drive the bird away if they can. Um, there are other reasons that crows get upset. Usually it's because there's some kind of predator or disturbance or threat to the crows, usually. Um, when, they're, when they're interacting with each other socially, they're going to not be quite so st strident. But if there's a whole bunch of crows all cawing at the exact same time, it's probably because there's a large predator in the immediate vicinity. What if it's the same every day and it just seems like they're having a party? Same spot. <laughs> is it in the evenings? Yeah, probably, late afternoon. So uh, crows roost communally. So all the crows from like the upper Roaring Fork Valley probably have one area where they all go to roost in the evening. And you'll see them commuting. In the daytime, they'll commute out from the, in the morning, they'll commute out from the roost to go spread out and go to wherever they're gonna find food during the day. And in the late afternoon, in the wintertime, 
you'll see them commuting back. And sometimes they'll be streaming overhead by the dozens uh, all on their way back to the, to the night roost. And then um, they'll, they'll gather before it gets fully dark and there can be hundreds and hundreds of crows and it can make an awful racket mm -hmm. when they're uh, conglomerating for their evening roost. So if it's every day and it sounds like a party, that may well be what's going on. Good question. Next question. Thank you. Um, when you're talking about the brown thrasher and all those different sounds, I kept thinking, okay, so then the baby birds come along and like, how do all those different songs get passed along to the babies? How do all the different songs get passed along to the babies? So there's two ways. It depends on the bird species. Some bird species learn their songs, meaning they have to practice. They have to hear their song of their species from adults, and then they have to practice it. And they're not very good at it at the start, and it takes them a couple months of practicing, and eventually they learn how to sing like adults. Other bird species don't learn their songs. It's genetic and inborn, and those bird species just automatically know how to sing their species song. So most, in, in most birds, vocalizations are innate. They are genetic. They are not learned. But in three groups of birds that we know about, there is vocal learning. If you are in a group of birds with vocal learning, the, the young birds have to hear what we, what we call um, tutors uh, singing. It's usually not the parents, although the parents also, they, all, they pay attention to the parents' songs as well. But the songs they actually learn best are typically the songs of their neighbors on their first spring territory rather than their parents. Um, and if they don't hear their own species song, they're never gonna learn that species, their own species song properly. So for example, uh, my friend Scott Taylor, who's an ornithologist at the University of Colorado, told me that there's a poor little black-capped chickadee somewhere that can only sing the song of an electric buzzer. <laughs> because it was raised in a lab and they didn't let it hear chickadee song, they only played the song of an electric buzzer to it, and so it learned to sing like an electric buzzer. <laughs> And because, and, and you know, it was, they were doing an experiment about vocal learning, but now uh, they can't release that bird back into the wild because it doesn't speak chickadee. And so it's living out its days in a zoo um, singing a buzzer song. Um, so a lot of birds are like that. Like they need to hear their own species song in order to learn it properly. Um, but some birds do not. So the flycatchers, they do not learn their songs. So a says Phoebe, if you take, it, take the egg out of the nest and raise it in captivity, you can play it the song of an electric buzzer. You can make sure it never hears a says Phoebe. It doesn't matter. That bird is going to sing just like its parents did because it's genetically controlled in flycatchers. The three groups of birds we know of that learn their songs are the so-called, the, the ossines, which are the so-called songbirds. That's everything in the, in the field guide after the flycatchers. So it's a lot of birds, it's almost half the book. Um, and then the parrots, no surprise there, and the hummingbirds, which surprises everybody. And the reason it surprises people in Colorado that hummingbirds can sing is because our hummingbirds don't sing. <laughs> Black chinned and broad tailed hummingbirds do not sing. Instead, they have replaced song with sounds that they make with their wings and tail. And then they do dive displays and make the special sounds with their wings and tail. But if you've been to California and you've heard Anna's hummingbirds, Anna's hummingbirds have these really complicated songs, staticky kind of radio songs. Uh, and that's actually typical. Most of the hundreds of species of hummingbirds sing and sing a lot and learn their songs. Um, just not the ones up here in the northern part. So, does that answer your question? Yeah, so the thrasher would be in the first group. The thrasher is, knows. thrasher has right. to learn it. Yeah. So that the, somehow those male brown thrashers are learning 
2,500 different song phrases that they're hearing from other singing brown thrashers. We don't know for sure that they're memorizing them all. One possibility for how the brown thrasher vocabulary got so big is that they might be improvising and making it up as they go along, like jazz musicians. We don't think that's the whole answer because at least some of those song phrases pop up exactly the same hours later or minutes later in the song. Um, whether it's all of them, we don't know, but I, I suspect that they probably don't improvise and they, or at least they don't improvise much and most of those songs are memorized from other brown thrashes that they've heard. And they would learn all that in the first year of their life. So they've got a lot of learning to do. Thanks for your question. I think we had a hand back here. About, about 25 years ago in Basalt, there was a parrot rescue in, right down there. We, uh, we adopted one for a while. The cops got called on us three times. It was so loud. And the whole facility got shut down because it was so loud. How far can the calls go? Where can the calls of a bird go? That's a great question. Those are parrots. Those are parrots. Parrots are loud. Um, especially macaws. Um, macaws are really, really loud. I would guess at least a mile away you can hear macaws coming uh, in the wild. Um, some birds are soft, some birds are loud. You've definitely noticed this. Um, not all bird songs project. Not all bird songs need to project. Dippers have to sing pretty loud because they're always right next to rushing water. Um, but then they don't sound that loud because they're always right next to rushing water. Um, <laughs> But in the tropics, there are birds like bellbirds um, that are really, really loud. I grew up in South Dakota, and one day I was out kind of on the prairie um, outside of town, and there was one tree. It was not a very tall tree. It was, it was no taller than the, the ceiling here. But I decided I was going to climb up in that tree because I was bored and I was a kid. And I climbed up in the tree, and while I was up there, a meadowlark flew into the top of the tree and started singing. And I had never been so close to a singing meadowlark before. Western meadowlarks, you can hear for at least a mile on the prairie. Um, when we were doing bird surveys, when I was doing bird surveys for Bird Conservancy, we had to like only count uh, meadowlarks if we could see them because like it's easy for you to go to all the 16 points for the whole morning and be counting the same meadowlarks over and over again because you're hearing every meadowlark within a, a mile radius. That meadowlark singing right above my head hurt my ears, <laughs> really hurt my ears. I'd never been that close to a bird that loud. Most birds are not nearly that loud. So uh, they have to be some of the loudest. I don't know what the absolute loudest birds are, but they can, they can tr carry their voices for at least a mile. Good question. You mentioned the 7,500 uh, bird sounds, uh, I believe, on the Peterson bird sounds and the the Merlin one is it more robust than that or um, is there do you have an answer in terms of like what they have collected and what they've gathered for the sounds we're talking about um, in the Merlin app when you go to um, you're not talking about sound ID right you're talking about um, where you go to a species and then listen to its sounds that's what you're talking about so. They have a library of sounds yeah, yeah. you can play for each yeah. species in Merlin. Yes. At this point, um, their, 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 um, when, let, let me put it this way. When my website went up, it was definitely a cut above what was in Merlin at that point. They keep adding stuff and improving stuff in Merlin. So at this point, I'd say they're probably about the same. Mine still has more of the rare sounds. Um, their cuts tend to be higher quality, um, but theirs, theirs are not always well labeled. It usually it's just song or call, and so they don't have the different kinds of sounds actually labeled which one is which, and you don't know where they're from until you click on them, but um, pretty close at this point. Thank you. Okay, we have time for maybe two or three more questions. Thanks. I was wondering if there's any genetic advantage to like a parrot or mimicking bird. Mimicry. This is a big issue. So, first
first thing I'm going to say is that um, biologists who study bird sounds don't call it mimicry. Um, they call it imitation. And the reason is because the word mimicry already has a defined meaning in biology. It's when one organism is trying to pass itself off as another organism, usually in order not to get eaten. So like when the viceroy butterfly looks like a poisonous monarch butterfly so that it doesn't get eaten, that's mimicry. Um, whereas usually when one bird imitates another bird species, it's not trying to pass itself off as that bird species. So for example, when a mockingbird imitates a Carolina wren, uh, it does not want to be mistaken for a Carolina wren. If it were mistaken for a Carolina wren, two bad things would happen. One is that all the other mockingbirds would ignore it, which the mockingbird does not want. And two is that angry Carolina wrens might attack it, which the <laughs> mockingbird does not want. So if you listen to a mockingbird, you'll hear it imitating that Carolina wren for like 10 seconds, and then it'll switch and start making a totally different sound that it knows. And then it'll switch and start making a totally different sound that it knows. And that's how it signals that it's a mockingbird to the mockingbirds, to the Carolina wrens, and to us. Why do mockingbirds do that? And starlings and lesser goldfinches and a bunch of other birds? We don't know for sure, but our best guess is that they're, they're imitating other birds for the same reason that human musical artists sample from each other's work. Like they'll go out and they'll hear something that they really like and they'll grab it and they'll remix it and turn it into something that is like distinctly new. And so that's almost always what you're hearing is you're not hearing a Carolina Wren song, you're hearing a Mockingbird song that just sampled Carolina Wren. Uh, that's what imitating birds tend to do. There are more imitating birds than you realize, by the way. So when you hear Cassin's finches singing, there's all sorts of imitations being tossed in there, often too fast for you to recognize. Um, the white-eyed vireo is a bird from southeast United States. Basically, every single note of its song was grabbed from some other bird species. But it doesn't sound like that because they're just stuck together so fast into something totally new that it sounds original. So, good question. And um, I have a two-part question. So, with the growing light pollution that we have in Aspen and also the Christmas tree lighting, which I participate in in my own yard, um, it, I always am very concerned like when the fireworks come because I do worry about the birds and, and the animals and what that does. But do you have any comments on the light pollution that we see in town um, and the height of the buildings and also in relation to all of the, the lighting that's going on in the trees. I mean, I'm just wondering, is that displacing birds? And is that a concern that we see in terms of their homes and where they nest? Because I, I notice that the birds in my yard tend to leave when I put up the huge Christmas tree lights all over the big trees. Question. Um, light pollution and height of buildings are primarily an issue for migrating birds. Uh, so not at Christmas time and not at 4th of July, but um, spring and fall. Spring and fall uh, is when birds are migrating uh, in large numbers. And I, I don't think you would have so much of a problem here in the Roaring Fork Valley because you're at the bottom of the valley. And so birds that are migrating are probably gonna be migrating at a much higher altitude because there's mountains all around. Whereas if you're, you know, downtown Denver has these tall buildings with lights up at the top and it can confuse migrating birds and sometimes they hit the buildings when they're migrating, because many, many birds migrate by night, in case you didn't know. And so they hit things like radio towers and wind turbines and lighthouses and skyscrapers, and, and it actually kills a lot of birds. Um, so it is, a, it is definitely a concern. It's less of, I think it's less of a concern outside of migration patterns and probably less of a concern here. Um, I don't know. I haven't... I haven't looked to see what kinds of studies there are on light pollution and birds, just straight up light pollution. I'm sure there's an effect of some kind. I don't know, and I'm reasonably certain somebody has studied it, but I haven't looked into those studies. Um, but I think that the main thing that we do that displaces birds is we change the habitat. We put a house there 
instead of trees. We put a yard there instead of bushes. We put a park instead of a natural area, you know. And so all of those things that we're already doing are probably more of a problem than turning on the lights, but turning on the lights probably doesn't help. Does that answer your question? One more round of applause for Nathan, please.